thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. With numberless blessings each moment he crowns and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He Salvation is wonderful love. I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and
this name. I am not John Miller. As your bulletins say, I apologize. I take the blame. Preaching schedule was messed up. So I am the one who puts it together, and so I am the one who gets to fill in when I mess up. No, that's not really what happened. John is preaching at, um, in Elkhart, the church up there. And uh, so they're meeting today up there, and we are meeting here. I trust that we can uh, quiet our hearts. I appreciated the songs very much, especially the last one, and um, the focus on Christ and, and adoring Him for His work on Calvary on our behalf. So I very much appreciated the message in that song. <clears throat> Imagine with me this morning that you are in the market to buy land. You spent some time deciding or determining what kind of property it should be and you know about the right amount of acreage you would like to have. You would like to build a house. You would like to maybe have room for a barn and some pasture land. And you would really, really like to have a nice pond somewhere on your land. Finally, you find a piece of property that looks like it would fit the bill, but it's not for sale. But you still contact the owner, you find out who owns it, and you contact the owner and you say, you ask him if he would consider selling the piece of land that you're talking about, and he refuses. And it's a sizable chunk of land, and it's beautiful, it has a lot of features on it that you wanted. And uh, so you proceed to ask him if he would mind if uh, you um, would occasionally ride your horse or in my situation, my four-wheeler. For all you horse lovers. On the property with my family. And um, he consents to that. He says it's just an investment property for him, but he's not willing to sell, and, and he's okay if we use it on occasion for recreation. And so you are delighted that he allows you to do that, and you take advantage of that. And on one of your excursions, either you're riding your horse or your four-wheeler, whichever one you prefer, and as you're riding along, you notice something sticking out of the side of the little hill that you're riding along side of and, and you stop and investigate. And you discover that what you thought was a large flat stone was actually a slab of concrete. And you begin to dig and you discover three more slabs of concrete that were about three feet by three feet square. And you discover that they are actually concrete vaults with lids on them. You quickly um, run home and grab a shovel and some things and you want to see what's inside and you pry the lids off. Inside you find gold, you find silver, all kinds of jewels, old antique coins and many other valuables. In one of them you find the entire thing packed full of $100 bills. And the other has innumerable gems. And all of a sudden you need that property. All of a sudden that property becomes way more valuable to you than it had before that treasure, that, those chests of treasure 
grips you. You call the owner and you beg him to sell the property. And he refuses. And for three days in a row you call him and you pester him. You don't even tell your wife what you found. You don't tell the owner. You, you don't tell the wife. Finally, the owner says, okay, fine, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to sell, but this is my price. And the price is extremely high. And you quickly realize that you can't afford it unless you sell everything you have, and then maybe you can afford it. But you quickly agree. You say, okay, fine, I'll buy it. I'll buy it. And you go home and you quickly put your house on the market to the dismay of your wife. You clean out your shed and you start selling off all the things that have collected in there and the attic and your garage and everything and you start selling. But you quickly realize that you're not going to have enough money if you're just going to sell that stuff and so you start selling the things that you value things that you care about. You end up selling your hunting land. You sell your boat. You sell all your gun collections. You sell maybe your old car collection. Sell all your heirlooms, your antique furniture. Whatever it is, everything's got to go because you will buy that property because in your mind, that property has enormous value. You even consider selling the children just so you have enough money. And then that quickly goes away. And you buy the piece of land once you have all the money, and you are convinced that it was well worth it to lose everything that you own, that you, that you held dear to you, that, that was important to you, you are convinced that it was the right thing to do. And that piece of land with all its treasure fulfills everything in you, brings you joy and peace like nothing before. And we say, how foolish. I invite you to turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. I would like to read the passage, and I think you already understand what I'm going, uh, getting at. The title of my message is Embracing the Kingdom of God. Embracing the Kingdom of God. <clears throat> I would like to begin in verse 10 of chapter 13, and then I'm maybe going to jump around just a little bit in chapter 13, but I, I want to end up with the parables of um, the, um, the man that found hid treasure in the field and then the pearl. That's where I want to end up at, okay? So I'm going to begin at uh, verse 10 of chapter 13 of Matthew. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And I just want to stop there briefly and say that to you here at Sandy Ridge, to you that are born again, to all the visitors. By the way, welcome, visitors. We're glad you're here. I see a few. To all of you who are born again this morning, is given to you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. And that could be a message in a sermon all itself. What are the mysteries of the kingdom? We're not going to go into that. My focus this morning is that we, together here at Sandy Ridge, gain a new and renewed vision for the kingdom of God. And we'll try to hopefully make that clear as we go on. So Jesus turns to his disciples and says, for you it is given to understand those mysteries, but to them it's not. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, 
from him shall be taken away even he that even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables. Because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are fat. Their, their, their heart is, is lethargic, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Blessed are ye, blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. So what I'd like to focus on this morning is the kingdom, and I'm just going to go down through this chapter, and I want to draw your attention to several things that Jesus says here. And... I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit will make it clear to you what we're trying to focus on this morning. In verse 19, Jesus uses the words, the word of the kingdom. And then down in verse 24, he says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto. And then you go over to verse 31, and he says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed. Verse 33, another parable spake he unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. And then in verse 38, The field is the world, and the good seeds are the children of the kingdom. You, you, you get the, the path that Jesus is going down. Everything, every time, many of his parables begin with referring to the kingdom of God. And then verse 44, this is where we want to end up at. Verse 44 through 46. This is where I take my own little allegory out of. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we need your help this morning in understanding the message that you are trying to say to us the message of the kingdom. God, I pray that you would help me to understand the things that uh, you've shown me. I pray, God, that you would help your people this morning to understand the Holy Spirit would be faithful in communicating the word to them this morning. So be with us. Bless our time together in the Word. Help us to be enthusiastic about the kingdom of God. Help us to embrace it as you intended. We pray in your name. Amen. So according to our text, this is a parable that Jesus spoke among many parables, a series of parables. And he ends up with this one, with these two saying, look, this is how the kingdom of God is. So my question to you and me this morning is, do I value the kingdom of God in the same way that I would value a field that I know has hidden treasure in it? Would I do the same thing that this man did and sell everything I have for the kingdom? Part of my, my thought process was began to be stirred on Wednesday night when I was preparing to, to go through the, through the um, guiding principles that we have. And I began to realize that what we put together here as a congregation 
is based on kingdom principles. And we ta I talked about that a little bit on Wednesday night. What we put together as guiding principles or guidelines is based in something way bigger, way more powerful, way more forceful than just you and I sitting down together and thinking up some things. Those things are based in a kingdom that is a reality in this world. And my desire this morning is that you and I gain a fresh vision for our role in that kingdom. For what we are called to do in that kingdom. And just in case that you think maybe the kingdom is not, there are those in today's world, there have been in history those that have said that kingdom is futuristic. That, that kingdom that Jesus is talking about here is only in the future, in heaven, in glory. There have been those in history today, and there will be till the end of time, those that say there is no such thing as God's kingdom. The reality is what we see today. What we see today is what it is. We have kingdoms here, kingdoms there. The reality is the world we live in. And they refuse to accept that there is a realm of a spiritual kingdom that is a reality that is a force that will be victorious at the end in this world. So back to my question. Would you, do you see the kingdom of God as valuable as you would any kind of treasure or any kind of pearl or any kind of thing that you can name that, that is pretty valuable to you and that you would give a lot of money for? Do you see it in the same light? Would you sell all that you have to be part of that kingdom? Because Jesus said, this is like the kingdom. This is what the kingdom is like. It is so valuable that men have died for it. There is no more greater and more noble thing than the kingdom of God. So my goal this morning is to help us understand that the kingdom of God is real and more importantly that a real focus needs to be on the kingdom of God and the gospel of the kingdom of God rather than on just living the Christian life. So I'd like to lay the foundation for the kingdom in Matthew 4.17, you can turn to that if you wish. <clears throat> Jesus begins his ministry by saying this. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And throughout the entirety of Jesus' ministry, this was his focus. He says, from, the, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so that's what I want to focus on this morning. The, the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is a reality. And Jesus used that terminology, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, at least 124 times in the Gospels. That, word is, those, that, that phrase is used by Jesus himself, in the Gospels. So I think it's fair to say that Jesus' focus was the kingdom of God. Jesus' focus was not salvation. Jesus' focus was not the redemption of you and me. That brought some heads up. Now, I want to be careful with that. Because included in the kingdom is salvation. Included in the kingdom is the redemption of you and me and every person that wishes to be. But I believe that Jesus' intent was that the kingdom is realized on earth. And that kingdom has always been and always will be. The saints in the Old Testament believed that God's kingdom was eternal. That His kingdom is forever. 
You can read it in the Psalms. And Daniel, when he spoke, with, spoke to Nebuchadnezzar about his dream, he made it clear to Nebuchadnezzar that God is the one who rules over the world and the nations and the kings. And he puts into place who he wants and when he wants. The saints in the Old Testament believed in a God and the kingdom of God from its beginning. David in the Psalms, in the Psalms talks about your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. From generation to generation, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. In uh, Psalm 103, 19, the Lord hath prepared His throne in the heavens, and His kingdom ruleth over all. And then in 145, verse 13, the kingdom is an everlasting king. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. And so we see that this idea, this whole idea of God's kingdom did not, did not appear with Jesus coming on the scene and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This kingdom has always been. In fact, I would like to suggest this morning that I believe that was God's original intent was that the people that He created were to represent His kingdom here on earth originally. There was no plan of salvation originally. There was no need of salvation. They hadn't fallen yet. But they did then. Satan came and messed with God's original plan. God wasn't caught off guard. That, that's another subject. But I believe that God's original intent was that mankind demonstrates His kingdom, His authority here on earth. And for thousands of years, that wasn't happening very well. He did choose a people a nation to demonstrate that. They failed miserably. They didn't catch on that that was what God wanted them to do. They did not catch on that God wanted them to demonstrate His authority, His kingdom to the people around them. All they could think about was themselves and how it would benefit them if they obeyed God. They did not embrace the kingdom in its reality, in its completion. They didn't focus correctly. They focused on themselves. And so, all of a sudden, the people out around them said, they don't, they don't make sense. So we asked ourselves the question, are we doing that? Are we focusing incorrectly on the kingdom? I believe that it's easy for us, and some of us may do that. I do it sometimes. I find myself going down this road that I, my focus in life is my salvation and staying saved. Nothing necessarily wrong with that. But what if my focus would be on the eternal God, on His kingdom, and demonstrating that rather than preserving myself? I demonstrate... I focus on Him and I demonstrate to the world around me that I'm part of something bigger than just myself. And so now we have Jesus. So all these years, the Jews were not doing well with demonstrating God's kingdom to the people around Him. And now we have Jesus coming onto the scene saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is now at hand. So follow this through. This was not some new thing that the Jews were... were this wasn't new to the Jews. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying. For years and years, they were expecting the kingdom of God to come. They were expecting the kingdom of God to come in such a way that was glorious 
and devastating to all the, the enemies around them. That's what they were expecting. So when Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, they were like, well, okay, yeah, we know all that. that that's not new to us, but what do you mean, Jesus? What's going on here? What do you mean by repenting? I'm putting it in my own words. It kind of threw them for a loop, and yet it was, it was something they were used to hearing and knowing about. What they did not understand was that the kingdom of God was coming, not in a tangible form, but in an intangible, invisible form powerful way. And Luke 17, verse 20 says this, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, the Pharisees were asking him, they said, Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? And he answered and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo, here, or lo, there, for behold, The kingdom of God is within you. That, brothers and sisters, is the connection between you and me and the kingdom. That is how the world is to see and demonstrate, see the demonstration of the kingdom. In you, in me. So we go back to the question how important is the kingdom of God to me? How valuable is the kingdom of God to me? I sometimes think I demonstrate how valuable it is to me, how much I chafe at kingdom principles. When I read Scripture and I'm meditating and I come up against a principle that is taught in God's Word and it kind of slaps me a little bit, what is my tendency? Do I, do I sidestep that? Do I want to ignore that? Do I think of someone else that needs to hear that? You see what I mean? Sometimes I think if you really want to know how much you value the kingdom, take inventory about how you react to its principles. Take inventory about on how we react to what the king of that kingdom asks of us. And then I think we can maybe get a little bit of picture of how valuable it really is to us. We find in those times, I find in those times, if I'm really honest with myself, that I am consuming my kingdom experience on myself. It's all about me. That's what the Jews were doing. God had chosen them to be that demonstration of his kingdom, and they consumed that on themselves and began to develop a religion that catered to them, allowed them to sidestep, whatever. I find that I can do the same thing. And my focus all of a sudden becomes me, myself, and I, and I'm consuming my religion, my Christianity, on myself. And I am not focusing on the kingdom, the king of that kingdom, and demonstrating well the principles of that kingdom so that the world says, wow, that group At Sandy Ridge, they demonstrate something that I have never seen before. Never. I wonder what that is. And all of a sudden, they start digging in that field of treasure that we have here. And they say, wow, I want that. I'm going to sell out. I want to be a kingdom Christian, too. The focus this morning is embracing the kingdom rather than the religion or your own Christianity, per se. Consuming it on your own, your own lusts. Preserving yourself. This kingdom is an eternal kingdom. 
the saints of old believed it. They missed it. Many of them missed it. Jesus comes on the scene and says, I am now introducing again the kingdom, and it's going to be in a different way. It is going to be in you. You will be my ambassadors. You will be my ambassadors for my kingdom. And so we need to focus on the kingdom because that's what Jesus focused on. Today we hear a lot about personal salvation, about personal relationship with Christ. But Jesus was focused on the kingdom. In his teaching and in his preaching, he was focused on the kingdom. That kingdom included salvation. That kingdom included bringing people into the kingdom. You cannot be part of the kingdom unless you are saved, born again. In the Lord's Prayer, this is what Jesus taught his disciples to, to pray. In that prayer, we say, Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I've preached this here before, and I believe it. The question that I ha ask when I read that is, how do you think, how do I think that that kingdom becomes a reality here on earth? Through you and me. That's how it becomes a reality. When we pray that prayer, this is not some abstract thing. This is not some kingdom that, that is in the future or that is ambiguous out there. It is a reality sitting here among you. In you. You are the kingdom. That's how the reality of the kingdom is demonstrated in this world. This is only half of the kingdom. The other half is to come. That's the consummation of Jesus Christ coming back. And the whole, the two halves will come together as a whole. Right now he says, I need you, I want you to demonstrate my kingdom here on earth. That kingdom is fulfilled and empowered by the Holy Spirit in your lives. In one of the parables, he says, he talks about um, a sower going out and sowing seed. There's two different parables. One is he's, it's about the tares, and the, the, the good seed comes up, and among it is the tares. The tares are the wicked ones, those who are among us that are not saved, who are not living for Christ. He says the kingdom of heaven is like that. There will be those among you who are not saved. And then he goes on several verses later to explain that parable and he says that the seed that was scattered are the children of the king or the children of the kingdom. You know who that is? That's you. You are, I am, the children of the kingdom. So it lays on us to embrace the kingdom, the principles of the kingdom, demonstrate his kingdom in this fallen world. The early church believed in this kingdom. The early church embraced this kingdom as the total focal point of their lives. The early Christians did not focus on ministry and outreach so much. They focused... We're not even going to go down that road. Don't, don't misunderstand me, okay? I, what, the point I'm making is the early church focused on the kingdom and, and Jesus the king of that kingdom. And Paul preached the kingdom. Several times in Acts... Paul refers to his preaching and his teaching as preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. One of his last statements was that, that he's been faithful to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Peter did the same thing. The early church focused on the kingdom of God and being kingdom-focused Christians people that wanted to demonstrate the kingdom. In our, in our guidelines the other night, 
we read a verse in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. What that verse tells me is that it is very easy for us, and it was easy for them, and at some point in, in the history of the Christian church, they turned their focus away from kingdom living, kingdom principles, and became very religious in their duties. Constantine brought in the popularity of Christianity. All of a sudden it was popular and it was right to be a Christian. And through all of that, the, the focus changed. What that verse tells me is that Paul was very concerned that the early church was losing their focus on kingdom living. It says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. So for us here at Sandy Ridge this morning, can we refocus, re-embrace what it means to live kingdom lives, to demonstrate His kingdom? I'm hoping to have some follow-up messages on what that looks like. What does that look like? in our lives. How do we demonstrate that? What does the kingdom look like? You can find a lot of your answers just by reading Jesus' parables. The parables that he, he said tells you a lot about what that kingdom looks like. What we should, how, how we should live. The bottom line concern this morning for us is that are we, can we, and will we be deceived by philosophies and vain, what does it say? Philosophy and vain deceit. And that can come through a variety of ways. After the tr traditions of men. And I'm not here this morning to challenge our, any of our traditions. Tradition can be good. What that's talking about is the world's traditions. There can be this twisting of values. Twisting of principles that say it's all right. God is okay with this. When actually His, his Word says, no, if you're going to be part of my kingdom, these are the principles you live by. The world, the Christians of the world, will say this. So my concern this morning for us at Sandy Ridge, and and I don't know that we're there. But, but it is a concern. If it was a concern for Paul in the early church, it ought to be a concern of ours. Are we and will we fall for vain deceit and philosophies of men? Because if we do, then God's kingdom will not be demonstrated the way He wants it to be in our lives. We will not be kingdom people. So the challenge is embrace the kingdom in its entirety. That means the principles that are laid out in Scripture for us to live by. In closing, I would wrap this up this way. The kingdom is real. God's kingdom is real. It always has been. And God wants a people to demonstrate his kingdom to the world. He doesn't want a people consumed by their own religion, their own salvation, making sure that they are living that way. I want to be careful how I say that because I don't want to give the wrong impression. That is important. But God wants just as Jesus was focused on the kingdom of God, God wants you and me to be focused on His kingdom. God wants us to embrace its values. And He wants us to be motivated by His kingdom to live here on earth. Till Christ comes again, let's be faithful in demonstrating His kingdom through our lives to the people around us. That includes here at Sandy Ridge. 
That includes you and me together, demonstrating that kingdom. And, and that's part of several other messages, is how do we demonstrate the kingdom to each other here at Sandy Ridge? Then how do we demonstrate it out there? Because we don't do well here, we can't do well out there. We have to learn to, to, to live kingdom lives among each other here. So Lord willing sometime in the future, follow-up messages on that. Let's pray.